dear students welcome to all of you my today's lecture is like a podium it is morphology anatomy and reproduction first i would like to give you the introduction of the topic lycopodium belongs to the division tridophyta and the order lycopodials the order includes slender weak stemmed plants with small most like leaves without ligules and club shaped fruiting bodies or strobili anthidia are of embedded type with biflagellated anthidiozoids the order with a single family lycopodiaceae comprises two living genera lycopodium and phylloglossum and the fossil lycopodiates the lycopodiums are familiarly known as ground pines trailing evergreens club mosses now the distribution and habit of the lycopodium lycopodium is worldwide in distribution and possesses about 400 species world over a large majority of the species are found in tropics plants are slender herbaceous or should be sporophytes with a wide range in habit and habitat in tropics there are mainly the pendulous epiphytes and the temperate ones are prostrate trailing forms with upright branches and others are erect plants all species have branching rhizome creeping above or below the surface of soil from which arise either branches aesthetically more valued are pendulous epiphytes now we will discuss its morphology the plants are rhizomatous herbs stems are clothed with small simple sessile leaves of broad base and single unbranched wing they range from minute scales to broad leaves 2 to 3 cm long leaves are mostly entire but in a few are serrate as in lycopodium serratum in most species leaves are sparely arranged but some species show whorled or decussate arrangement the branching is fundamentally dicotomous roots are adventitious occur on the under surface of the stem the genus has been classified into two subgenera members of subgenus rhodostachia are terrestrial species with prostrate creeping axis and erect branches the adventitious roots occur at the branchings the first branch may be dicotomous but later branchings may appear more monopodial and equal dichotomy sporophylls are with dentate margins are smaller than foliage leaves and form strobili which are simple or branched species including the subgenus do not form bulbils in another subgenera eurostachia the plants do not have creeping axis but are erect if terrestrial or pendulous if epiphytic with the dicotomous branching the adventitious roots emerge at the basal region only the sporophylls are alike to foliage leaves and are restricted either to distal end of the stem and branches or are present on alternate zones of fertile branches and sterile leaves are present all along the stem and branches plants generally form bulbils in lycopodium growth takes place by a group of meristematic cells rather than a single apical cell as in stems of most terophytes in dicotomous branching single center of meristematic activity gives rise to two the initiation of unequal centers is common and results in pseudo monopodial branch as in lycopodium densum and lycopodium obscurum the most unequal branching results in the formation of condensed axis which becomes specialized for vegetative propagation and are called bulbils or gamy which on falling from the parent plant secure vegetative propagation the factors favoring the formation of bulbils are not known now we will discuss the anatomy of lycopodium histologically the stem has one celled epidermis with stomata a cortex and a central vascular cylinder the relative thickness of the cortex and the steel is variable in different species the cortex in some species remains parenchymatous and in others with age the cortex gets sclerified into outer and inner zones forming three bands and in extreme cases the entire cortex gets sclerified 
long aerial stems normally has three zoned cortex. Hypodermal chlorenchyma followed by parenchyma and sclerenchyma encircling the stem. In substerian stem, the cortex is often completely sclerenchymates. Aerial stems often have large air spaces in cortex due to disruption of cells. Endodermis is usually ill defined and can be identified in younger portions due to thickened radial walls that is known as Casperian strips. Internal to endoderms is pericycle layer of three to six cells. Stellar anatomy differs from species to species and even within the single species. However, young plants in all the species confirm to a single pattern. A single roll of xylem and radiating arms and phloem in between xylem arms. Now, xylem and phloem are separated from each other by a layer of stellar parenchyma. Some species even retain this simple satellite arrangement with xylem of only four arms in a deviation from this basic pattern. A regular and increased furrowing of xylem takes place and in a cross section it appears as isolated strands as in Lycopodium lucidulum. The furrowing may result into plate like lobes as in Lycopodium mulibi. In some forms, the xylem retains its radiating arms pattern, but also has patches of xylem within the, within the band xylem, separated by parenchyma or strands of phloem, as in Lycopodium sclerosum. The steel is XR. Wilder 1970 has, however, found the Mazari xylem in Lycopodium clavatum, Lycopodium tristium, and Lycopodium decidulum. The protozoal elements form a peripheral group of up to 20 cells with few or no intermixed parenchyma cells. This feature separates Lycopodium from all other living vascular plants. Their secondary wall thickenings consist of indirectly connected rings. Metazylum tracheids are either scalariform or have circular bordered pits. The sieve cells of the phloem are elongated and pointed. The CU areas are scattered and are inconspicuous on lateral and end walls. The embryonic root is short lived. The roots on older plants are adventitious and show equal dichotomous branching. Over the apical meristem of the root is the calaptra, and proximal to the apex is a long zone of unicellular hairy extensions borne in profusion. The cortex in the roots with a complete tissue maturation is often completely sclerenchymates. The xylem is crescent shaped with phloem in the concavity. The roots are often diarch. Two protoxylem points are the two poles of U and C shaped vascular strand, but often one or more protoxylem points are also located on the convex side of the steel. The former matures earlier than the later. The roots originate chiefly from pericycle tissue of the stem and do not grow out straight through cortex, but grow vertically through the stem cortex before emerging below. As a result of transection of stem, many roots are seen in the cortex and are oriented in such a way that the open ends of the xylem face towards the outside of the stem. The roots of lycopodium are peculiar in two respects. The little ones are not endogenous in origin, and the root hairs are paired. In some species, the root steel is very similar to the stem steel. At the point of attachment with the rhizome, the root is polyarch and exarch. Therefore, except for size, it becomes difficult to distinguish the two organs. Reproduction. Now, we will discuss the different types of reproduction in a lycopodium. Lycopodium reproduce vegetatively by various propagules such as gemmae or bulbils, body fragments, formation of resting buds, formation of root tubercles, and by the formation of adventitious buds, asexually by support formation, and sexually by the formation of specialized sex organs. Now we will discuss these reproductive methods one by one. Number one, vegetative propagation. It occurs by the following methods. Number one by the formation of gemmae 
or bulbules. These are modified vegetative structures that arise as lateral outgrowths from near the stem apses and take the place of leaves. They have been reported in Lycopodium slago, Lycopodium phlegmaria and Lycopodium lucidulum. Each bulbil comes of a short and reduced axis surrounded by a number of thick and fleshy leaves. These leaves store food material. They remain on the plant till the root primordia appears on the shortened stem. The gametes fall on the ground and grow into a new young plant. Now, number two is fragmentation. Death and decay of the older regions of the stem leads to the separation of younger branches, which grow into separate plants. This is the most common method of vegetative reproduction in Lycopodium. Now, the formation of rusting buds. In a Lycopodium indulatum, the tips on the apical buds of the rhizome and its branches store food material and become surrounded by densely crowded leaves forming the rusting buds. In winter, the whole plant except these rusting buds die off and at the advent of the favorable conditions, the rusting buds resume growth and give rise to the new plant. By the formation of root tubercles, in a Lycopodium ramulosum, the tubercles originate from the parenchymatous regions of the root cortex. They consist of a group of cells which store food material and protected by thick walls and have the capacity to germinate in the new plant. Now, we will discuss the asexual method of production in Lycopodium. The asexual spores are formed within the sporangia, which are all alike, homospores. The sporangia are born on the upper surface of sporophylls. These sporophylls are born at the distal end of main axis or branches to form citroboli or cones. The cones rarely may be born on the long stalks with cicae like leaves. The sporophylls are smaller than foliage leaves and in some species they are chaffy scales with dentate or serrate margins. In pendulous epiphytes, the stroboli are often highly branched. In stroboli of Lycopodium drumendi, the apex becomes active and forms a vegetative axis with reduced leaves, which in turn matures into a, into a strobulus. In some species, for example, Lycopodium decidulum, where cones are not formed, Sterile and fertile leaves from alternate zones all along the stem and in some all leaves in a mature plant form sporangia. Such species are considered to be primitive and are included in slago group. These species characteristically have undifferentiated strobulus, closely similar vegetative leaves and sporophylls and the entire metazylum elements consists of circular bordered pits. Each sporophyll produces only one sporangium. The sporangium is born on the upper adaxial surface of the sporophyll, but later may become axillary. The sporangia are 1 to 2.5 mm in diameter, reniform to subspherical with short stalk or paired like base. The mature sporangia are yellowish and liberate spore through a slit. In a wall transverse to sporophyll, in many species, the sporophylls fold backwards, exposing the sporangia as they mature. Sporangia in shells differentiate normally on the upper side when sporophyll is still embryonic. Therefore, in a long section of the developing cone, all stages can be seen by pericline division. The initials form inner and outer layers of the cells. The mature layers form sporogenous cell and the outer layer forms the sporogenous stalk and the wall of the sporangium. This process in which sporangia develops from a group of superficial, superficial cells is known as eusporangiate method. After pericular division, due to the differential growth that is, the active region in the sporogenous tissue results in upward bulging and the sporangium assumes a reniform shape. 
later precalcine division in surface layer lead to the formation of five celled outer layer the layer surrounding the sporangium cells stain deeply and acts as taptum and gets decomposed during maturation of spores as the sporangia mature the peripheral layers also break down and the mature sporangium has only one cell thick wall due to the breakdown of peripheral cells and the tapetal layers spores come out and come to lie in a fluid mass the spores which are produced in a large quantity are homospores that means all the spores are identical small light with smooth or ornamented walls and a triradiate mark a point of attachment in spore tetra they contain oil as reserve food material and in some species are chlorophyllous now we will see the spore germination spore germinates in few days after dispersal and form small free living green prothallae such prothallae are cylindrical or ovoid with branches or lobes and are somewhat short lived maturing in the same season in other species the spores are non green and thick walled the germination is delayed by years and in the meantime spores get buried and form subterranean mycorrhizic prothallae which are non green to begin with such prothallae are top shaped and later become irregular or convoluted and takes years to mature the former type surface living and green prothallae is prevalent in tropical species and later subterranean and non green in temperate creeping ones the gametophytes very early in their development at just 4 to 5 cell stage come to have a mycorrhizal association further growth takes place by group of meristematic cells organized at the apex gametophytes in some species are partly subterranean with chlorophyllous aerial portion in some epiphytic species for example in lagopodium phlegmaria the prothallus is irregularly fragmented and these fragments form gamy which secure vegetative propagation of the gametophytic generation sexual reproduction in lycopodium the sexual reproduction is oogamous type the sex organs are present at the anterior end of the prothallae the prothallae are mono monoecious and each sex organ originates from a single superficial cell just behind the apical meristem in subterranean types the anthridia and archegonia form distinct patches and cover the entire crown or the base of its lobe in elongate types they are present on the central cushion and are intermingled anthridia are sunken and produce a large number of pear shaped biflagellate anthrodiozoites which are attracted chemotactically by the archegonial exudate cytrus archegonia are sunken at the venter and only the neck protrudes subterranean prothallae have archegonia of long necks as many as 14 neck canal cells as in lycopodium campanulatum and surface living prothallae have short necked archegonia sometimes just one neck canal cell in lycopodium cernum at maturity the neck canal cells and the ventricular canal cells disorganize creating an open passage for the anthrodiozoites to enter the neck and reach the egg now we will discuss the development of anthridia the prothallae are normally monoecious but the anthridia usually develop first the anthridia originates from a single superficial cell just behind the apical meristem this is known as anthridial initial it divides the pericardial wall into an outer and inner cell the outer cell known as the primary wall cell or jacket initial divided by repeated anticline division and forms a jacket layer one cell in thickness in surface view there appears a small triangular cell in the middle of the jacket layer known as opercular cell which marks the point of exit of the anthrodiozoites the jacket layer in lycopodium phlegmaria is two layered towards the periphery the inner cell called the primary androgonial cell by successive divisions forming a large number of androgonial cells 
the endoguinal cells further divide to form introduced mother cells or endocytes. The metamorphosis of the endocytes into endocytes has not been followed in detail, but According to Lang, 1988, it resembles with that in other vascular cryptograms. The mature anthridia vary in size, shape, and in the number of anthridioses in different species. They are entirely or in part sunken in the tissue of the prothallus and consists of oval mass of endocytes projecting slightly from the prothallal tissue and surrounded by a wall, which is partly formed by the jacket layer developed from the jacket initial of the young anthridium and partly from the prothallal cell or prothallal tissue. The anthridiozoid may be an oval cell about twice as long as wide with the anterior end somewhat pointed and bearing two long flagella. For example, in clacobrim clavatum or it may be elongated and somewhat twisted with two flagella, for example, in clacopodium phlegmaria. In a lycopodium clavatum, the nucleus lies on one side of the cell and the cytoplasm forms the greater part of the anthridiozoid. The anthridiozoids are less specialized than those of other pterodophytes and are much like those of bryophytes. Now, we will see the dehiscence of the anthridium. When the anthridium is mature, either the single triangular opercular cell or some cells of the jacket layer become mucilaginous and then the androcytes absorb water and rupture the anthridium. Now, we will discuss the archegonia and its structure. The archegonial initial is superficial. It divides by a periclinal wall into an outer primary cover cell and inner central cell. The primary cover cell divides by two intersecting walls into four neck in shells which divide further by transverse walls to give rise to the neck that varies from three to many cells in height. The neck is composed of four longitudinal rows. The central cell divides by transverse wall into an upper primary neck canal cell and a lower primary venter cell. The former may function directly as a single neck canal cell in the archegonia of aerial prothallae or it may divide repeatedly by transverse division to form a variable number of neck canal cells. In a lycopodium flago, there may be up to seven neck canal cells. In lycopodium campanulatum, there are 14 to 16 neck canal cells. The primary ventral canal cell undergoes a transverse division to form a lower egg cell and upper ventral canal cell. In some cases, the primary ventricular cell does not divide at all and becomes slightly broader and functions directly as an egg cell. In the mature archegonium, the neck portion protrudes out while the ventricle remains sunken. The axial row of an archegonium consists of an egg and a varying number of neck canal cells and a ventricular canal cell. At maturity, the neck canal cells and the ventricular canal cells disorganize creating an open passage for the anthrodiozoids to enter the neck and reaches the egg. Now, we will see the embryo, the new superophyte. First division of the fertilized egg is transferred to the long X of the archicle. The outer suspensor cell normally does not undergo any division or may become three celled. The inner cell gives rise to two superimposed tires of four cells each. The upper tire in some species swells up to form a foot and from the lower tire is derived the embryo proper. Two cells facing the stem develop into stem and other two forms leaves and primary root. A root differentiates laterally at a place where apical region and foot are joined. In some species, Lycopodium serenum, distal tire develops into a massive globose structure, protocolum and, and pushes its way away through gametophyte. The protocolum bears rhizoids and form from its upper surface differentiate leaf like avascular structures that protophylls. After the formation of many protophylls, a shoot meristem is organized on the protocolum. The 
first uh, root arises from the base of the stem. Protocarum, because of its structural organization, apparently intermediate between gametophyte and sporophyte, has been looked upon by earlier workers as evolutionary forerunner of leaf of leafy vascular plant. Dear students, with the completion of the refraction of lycobodium, I think uh, we have completed all the parameters of our today's lecture, which was lycopodium. I think all of you have liked it. Thank you.